20 films. 20 films is what it took for Marvel to finally put a female character in the title of one of their films. Still, she only gets second billing. It's Ant-Man and the Wasp, but hey, it's a step in the right direction. Am I right? Hey up, guys. So, today's film under the microscope is Ant-Man and the Wasp which is once again directed by Peyton Reed, the chap who directed the previous Ant-Man film, and once again stars Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly as the titular characters Ant-Man and the Wasp. This film takes place after the events of Captain America's Civil War, but before the events of Avengers Infinity War. So yeah, it's sandwiched in between two war films, essentially. Our protagonist, Scott Lang, played by Rudd, is under house arrest in this film because of his involvement in that showdown at the German airport in Captain America's Civil War. Apparently he broke the Sokovia Accords Agreement. And he's also fallen out of the good graces of Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas, and his daughter, Hope, who's played by Evangeline Lilly. But when Scott reveals to Hank that he had a spookily accurate dream about Hank's old wife, Janet, who's played by Michelle Pfeiffer in this film. Hank believes that because Scott went to the quantum realm in the previous Ant-Man film, which is where his wife ended up, that uh, he somehow got this quantum entanglement with her. And yeah, that she is trying to communicate through Scott to basically say, hey, I'm alive in the quantum realm, come rescue me. And that basically becomes the main storyline of the film is that Hank and Hope will develop this machine to go into the quantum realm to try and rescue Janet. That's the main plot, but it's not the only plot in this film. I didn't know it was actually possible for a film to overwhelm and underwhelm me simultaneously, but that's weirdly how I felt whilst I was watching Ant-Man and the Wasp because I was overwhelmed with how much was going on, but also underwhelmed with parts of its execution. This film is by no means a disaster, but it does buy off a little more than it can chew. So besides the main plot to rescue Janet from the quantum realm, there are all these other subplots going on at the same time. So we've got one subplot involving the main villain who's called Ava, or Ghost, because she can phase through matter like a ghost. And she's played by Hannah John Kamen, and she's trying to access the quantum realm herself. Then there's the secondary villain called Sonny, who's played by Walton Goggins. And he's like a disgruntled businessman who has his own beef with Hank and Hope. Then there's Scott trying to be a good dad for his adorable daughter Cassie, played by Abby Ryder Fortson. There's Lawrence Fishburne, who's introduced as Dr. Bill Foster, who is a former colleague of Hank Pym's. And they've got a previous history with S.H.I.E.L.D. They get a little bit of exploration there. There's Michael Peña's Luis, who's got his aspiring security business that he's trying to get Scott involved with. And then there's the obligatory romance between Scott and Hope, where they're trying to sort of rekindle the relationship. But it all feels a little bit flat. As you can imagine, it's a bit of a jumble. And there are times where the film really does struggle and lacks cohesion. It's evident in the editing. There are some scenes which really didn't flow into each other smoothly. There's an escape scene, which is immediately followed by this lab experiment scene and the passage of time between the two scenes feels a bit odd and the behavior of the characters doesn't feel right. It feels like there was a scene in between these two scenes which was cut somewhere. It feels like this film could have done with a few more rewrites. And whilst Hope or the Wasp does get bumped up to a titular character, it still very much feels like Ant-Man's film and she's on the sidelines. She does get one very awesome scene at the beginning of the film in a kitchen. It's a really good action sequence which showcases her powers and she's got wings which is pretty cool. But uh, the rest of the film, yeah, she doesn't have as much to do as Ant-Man. And I thought this being Ant-Man and the Wasp, there was going to be more of a tag team reliance on each other. And it's just not there like throughout the rest of the film. But what I love about the Ant-Man films is that they're not afraid to be absurd. It comes with the whole shrinking and enlarging concept. There's a lot of fun to be had with that, especially when you get scenes where buildings turn into like travel size luggage with wheels on the bottom and a handle and then like Hello Kitty Pez dispensers being thrown at the baddies. It's very inventive and amusing and it takes advantage of all the potential sight gags that you can have with a concept like this. After the devastation of Avengers Infinity War, Ant-Man and the Wasp allows Marvel fans to breathe and recuperate and just enjoy some silliness. Also Paul Rudd helped write the script for this film so there's a lot of deadpan humour I love it when they take the mickey out of the fact that they say quantum like so much in this film. Like, quantum this, quantum that. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of anything? You can play a very good drinking game watching this film. Take a shot every time someone says the word quantum. You'll be passed out by the halfway point. And Michael Peña gets another scene-stealing, storytelling, fast-talking monologue moment. And it's to do with truth serum. But yeah, when you see it, you're gonna love it. The acting is all on point. I particularly liked Hannah John Kamen's performance. Even though I feel like her character wasn't as developed as it could have been, 
she still gives a solid performance with what she's given. She was in Ready Player One and Black Mirror and now this, so yeah, she's certainly one to watch out for. I feel like the movie would have been better if they hadn't had the whole Walton Goggins subplot with him, you know, trying to track down Hank and Hope and steal all their work and stuff. It didn't really add too much to the story, it just sort of felt like one more unnecessary subplot that was just added on. And even though it does bounce off a few of the other subplots, I still feel like they could have found a way to not have that in there at all and the film would have been pretty much exactly the same. So yeah, I don't remove that. But I will say this, despite this film having a ridiculous amount of subplots, it still does feel very self-contained. Like there isn't this massive need to set up more MCU films in this, okay? It's all very much just about Ant-Man's storyline. I mean, there is one thing that's linked to further Marvel movies, and that's in the post credit sequence, but I won't spoil it for you. Yeah, it just feels very nice and contained, this film, which I liked. Right, time for those three questions. Would I watch this again? Yeah, I'm not gonna be in a rush to watch this again, but yeah, I would happily watch this again at some point. Um, would I recommend that you guys go watch this? Certainly, it's not gonna blow your mind, but it's fun and funny and good action, good special effects, solid performances. It does have a few problems with its editing and it does, you know, take on a lot more than it needs to. And it, at times it can feel choppy and like a bit too much going on, a bit too much to digest. It feels a little bloated, but yeah, I'd say give it a watch. And score out of 10? I'm gonna give Ant-Man and the Wasp a 6.5 out of 10. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you have seen Ant-Man and the Wasp, be sure to let me know what you thought of it. And my quick question for you guys today is, what female Marvel character would you love to see get her own movie, okay? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments, all right? And if you do like the content, do hit subscribe, but only if you want to. Thanks so much for watching, guys. For more things related to movies, TV, and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Hirfield, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye.